Hello, my name is Richard Trett. I'm the Managing Director of AXT. I'm pleased to open the introduction to this webinar conducted by AXT in collaboration with our partner, Lincean. AXT is a dynamic distributor of high-tech instrumentation in Australia and New Zealand, and have a large product range covering microscopy, microanalysis, nanofabrication and nanotechnology. We pride ourselves in building strong partnerships with our customers and suppliers, bringing together the best in scientific innovation and research with cutting edge scientific instrumentation and characterization, truly unique tools to facilitate your research. That um, our company, Lensian, is in the business of uh, developing and selling um, mini synchrotrons. We call it the Lensian Compact Light Source. We have been at it for a long time. The company already got founded in 2002 by a team uh, from Stanford. And really the core competency of the company is uh, these accelerator-based light sources. And we also, of course, are active in uh, the coupling optics and also in facilitating coupling instrumentation and end stations to that light source to enable science and perform measurements. And as Richard has said, there's already an installation in Germany that has been now operating for more than two years and uh, basically operating day to day and they mainly do biomedical imaging. We'll see some of the things they do um, uh, in a moment. And we are located in the, U in the United States, in the Bay Area, close to San Francisco. So I will do a quick introduction and tell you what has been going on in the field of traditional compact source technology based on traditional technology, uh, motivating the need for a mini synchrotron to bridge the gap to large scale synchrotrons, and then talk about what you can do with such a mini synchrotron and what type of applications we already looked at. So the development of laboratory x-ray sources has been um, slow if you look at how the brightness of such sources has developed over time and of course, that started out with the first sources around 1900, and then there was a step function with the introduction of rotating anode sources. Uh, and then really the, the um, power of X-rays started to get harnessed with the availability of this accelerator-based light sources. And one thing that you, will, that you see is that there's this big gap opening up as time goes on between traditional electron impact sources and accelerator-based light sources. And this gap is what we intend to fill uh, for applications, uh, X-ray applications. Now, you're, most of you are probably familiar with electron impact uh, sources. They generate X-rays by slamming uh, electrons into a target. And the very early tubes, they just had a filament accelerating electrons on a target and taking out the X-rays. The rotating anode um, improved upon this. And one thing to note is that the brightness, which is one of the important qualities of an X-ray source, is determined in these electron impact sources by how much power you can load on the square um, area of these sources. So the introduction of the rotating anode where you get a fresh piece of metal as you rotate the target around led to the step function of increase in brightness. And then more recently, this has been taken to another level using liquid metal jets and producing uh, even higher power loadings. And 
the, the trend has been to improve brightness over time in these sources. However, one of the other things that has happened is the brightness came at the expense of total X-ray flux because it's achieved by using smaller and smaller spot sizes. This shows you uh, just uh, how this liquid metal jet source looks like. The technology is you have a liquid metal jet of gallium, electrons impinging on it, X-rays being generated, a jet size of 200 microns thereabouts, and the spot size of the X-rays that's generated is in the range of 5 to 40 microns typically. And this jet runs at a very high speed so that the heating of the target by the electrons is less of an issue. Uh, these sources can reach, for very small spot sizes, quite a bit increase in brightness, which gives them a, a measurable advantage over other stationary and rotating anode um, sources. And this is a commercial product. Uh, this has been uh, shared with Exilum. Um, you can buy this off the shelf. And just to summarize that, the liquid metal jet, it has a high brightness. That means many photons per pixel in a, in a focusing application. But it has a very small spot size, which requires uh, careful x-ray optics to preserve the flux. Another big advantage, uh, disadvantage that all of these electron impact sources share is it, they have a fixed x-ray energy. So there's no spectroscopic capability. Um, the liquid metal jet, uh, this, this here was meant to talk about X-ray microscopes. So X-ray microscopes with liquid metal jet, there's two, two um, prototypes in operation, no publications yet. Uh, but liquid metal jets are quite widely used, and I think they have on the order of approaching uh, 50 systems installed in the field. Um, Another development recently over the last few years is by uh, my fellow uh, colleague, Wen Bingyun, who formed a company called Sigray. And he's approaching this uh, with, from a different direction, still slamming electrons into a target. Uh, and in a regular target, what you have is this heat problem. You have a heat zone building up. You, pre, you reach the melting point, and that leads to target failure. He has developed a technology where he structures the target with a high conductivity material. This is diamond, low density. And what happens then when the electrons are impinging is that the heat that's generated in these structures can be removed much more efficiently. <coughs> And he also took this uh, yet to, to another uh, direction in that he, he also developed a, a source where he has a structured target where he looks at the target sideways to amplify the uh, emission from these targets. Now, his developments, Sigray's developments, they also address the brightness also have a small spot. <coughs> um, they have one advantage over the liquid metal jet is you can use different target materials in the same source. And he demonstrated up to four right now that enable to do elemental imaging. But really, it's not tunable, so you cannot do spectroscopy. <coughs> In terms of X-ray microscopy, there's a microscope in development, but no uh, publications yet. Now, this motivates uh, uh, the need for a mini synchrotron. And I'm going to describe to you now the technology around our synchrotron. 
Um, you're familiar with the big synchrotrons. You have one in Australia and Melbourne. These are can be considered as kind of the supercomputers of X-ray science. They are quite expensive to build and maintain. And also access to these facilities is uh, somewhat restrictive. The idea now is to take this technology of a big synchrotron length scale of hundreds of meters and shrink this down by a factor of 100 to a length scale approaching one meter in terms of the ring to make this accessible to um, many institutions and make it locally accessible and create something that mimics like a workstation, an intermediate between a big synchrotron and a regular traditional laboratory source. Now the question, how can you actually um, do this? How can you shrink a synchrotron by a factor of 100 and still make the hard x-rays that are produced by these big facilities? So typical big synchrotrons, they are large, they use a very uh, large electron energy, they use undulators for insertion devices to create x-rays, and these undulators are permanent magnets. Now, the only way to shrink down a synchrotron from length scale of 100 meters to one meter is you have to reduce the electron energy by a factor of 100. And the reason for that is that the bending of the electrons is limited by the field strength of the magnets and the bend radius is proportional to the energy. So very simple, you have to go to smaller electron energy. Now, what happens then is at these energies, if in the bending magnets with a field of one Tesla, the radiation generated goes from X-ray to infrared. So clearly that's not the way to generate X-rays in a compact light source. Now, if you look at insertion devices at undulators, and you look at the equation describing the wavelength of the light generated, <clears throat> to the energy of the electrons, you find that if you had an undulator that was a factor of 10,000 smaller in period, that's the factor E squared here, you would be able to generate the same wavelength of X-rays as in the high energy mach machine. And this is the core point of the compact light source, you switch from using permanent magnet structures like shown here, to actually having the electron beam interact with a laser field that acts like the undulator with a period that is much smaller, which is the wavelength of the light. Um, now here, schematically shown the architecture of the compact light source. It is a, a real synchrotron. In other words, it has a, a linear accelerator, an, uh, an electron gun that gen generates the electrons. Um, the electrons are accelerated to their final energy and then injected into the very small storage ring. And in the straight section here, where you put the undulator, because you want a laser undulator, we have a laser cavity here, schematically shown mirrors, and a, a, a picosecond pump laser that, that feeds pulses into this cavity. Now, I hope that the movie shows uh, in this remote presentation, it shows the, the laser pulse being injected into the cavity and bouncing back and forth. And then the electrons up here being accelerated and injected into the ring. And then the l laser photons and the electron bunch interact right here in the straight section X-rays are generated, synchrotron radiation 
from this undulator is emitted in the forward direction and exits toward the experiment. So do we have any questions so far on the technology of the mini synchrotron? Any questions so far? No. Okay. So let me uh, then go further. This shows you a CAD drawing of the system that, again, here's the linear accelerator with the RF structures that accelerate the electron beam. Here, the storage ring where the electrons are kept on this circular orbit. There are bending magnets to bend them around and focusing magnets to keep the beam size small. Here's the interaction region. And one difference in the actual implementation of the system to the sketch showed previously is that the cavity, the laser cavity that stores the picosecond laser pulse that acts as the laser undulator is a cavity that uses four mirrors. That is for practical purposes to be able to steer the light beam and make it overlap with the electron beam perfectly. The beam sizes in here are very small, so this is quite sensitive. The source size of the X-rays, which is approximately the same as the size of the light and the electron beam, is on the order of 100 microns full width half maximum. This here shows you a picture of the system which has been shipped to Munich and installed there. So you see again here the linear accelerator. The ring is up here. The X-rays exit through an exit window here and then go through the shielded enclosure, which is ne necessary to enclose the system into the experimental area on the other side. Now, this is a true synchrotron, so you can tune the X-ray energy. However, there's one key difference. In a synchrotron, when you have an undulator, you would open and close the undulator gap to change the energy. This is not really possible in our system because we have what's the equivalent of a fixed undulator gap. So the way that we tune the energy in our system is by increasing or decreasing the electron beam energy. And we have quite a bit of tunability that allows us, this is shown for the system in Munich, to tune the energy there from 15 to 35 keV uh, pretty much continuously. And there's a little detector artifact here which is not, not really present. And what you get is really the output that looks like an undulator spectrum. It has only a few percent full width path maximum so very monochromatic. One key difference to a synchrotron is there is no higher harmonic generation, so you do not end up with multiples of the space energy, which is very convenient for experimental setups since you don't have to do harmonic rejection. Now, how many X-rays can you get out of such a system? The equation which actually describes the generation of X-rays is very simple. It says that the X-ray flux is given by the luminosity of the interaction of the electrons with the light photons multiplied with the Thomson cross-section. Now, one big hurdle for making a practical source is that this Thomson cross-section is incredibly small. It's 10 to the minus 29 square meters. So the luminosity of this interaction has to be very high to get a high X-ray flux. Now the luminosity is given by the frequency of the interaction and the product of the, um, of the uh, photon and electron numbers within the cross section where they interact and then divided by the cross-sectional area of the interaction. Now, 
In our system, <clears throat> this is addressed by having a very high interaction frequency. This is the principal reason why you need an electron storage ring and not only a linear accelerator with a laser firing at the linear accelerator. This gives you a very high repetition rate. So you already have seven orders of magnitude right here with the collision frequency. The other one, maximizing the laser photons, is achieved by using a laser cavity that allows us to produce a picosecond laser pulse with incredibly high power. The system in Munich, after an upgrade that we did last year, has a laser power in the cavity of 300 kilowatts, which is in a, a very high um, stored power. And, and of course, the electron number determined by how many electrons you can pack in a bunch. And this is facilitated by the linear accelerator and the ability to inject and store a, a very high electron charge. And of course, you need to focus them down. We focus them down to about 100 micrometers to get the cross-sectional area very small so that this denominator here uh, is, is very small. Now, putting in the numbers, what do you get? Uh, the system in Munich, which we call the version 1.1, because we upgraded it is last year, produces an X-ray flux within the natural bandwidth of 3 times 10 to the 10 photon per second at a source size in RMS of 45 microns. This is a, a strongly collimated beam that has a divergence of only 4 milliradians and produces a source brightness in terms of the natural bandwidth of 5 times 10 to the 11 photons per second per square um, milliradian per square millimeter in the natural bandwidth of the emission. The tunable X-ray energy range of the system is from 8 to 35 keV and using an infrared 1 micron laser. And of course, as a synchrotron, it also shares the time characteristics. Um, however, for most experiments, this is not really a consideration because you look at the source as a quasi-continuous source. The next system that we are going to build and that we are currently offering to customers is, again, an improvement on the system that we already have. It will increase the total flux and brightness by about another order of magnitude. And, uh, uh, achieve that by uh, mainly upgrades to the electron beam system that we have uh, currently uh, developed. In the future, and I'm talking here uh, time scales of five to ten years, we already identified more projects to increase the flux and brightness. Uh, by another order of magnitude. Um, and also, because of the energy range, we have also been looking into ways to extend the energy range to lower energies. So this is especially important for analytical applications like spectroscopy and to go to higher energy applications, up to 100 keV monochromatic. And we do that by using different wavelength uh, with laser light. Now, how does this compare to traditional continuous Bremsstrahlung sources? So shown here is a typical source that's used in a lot of micro CT equipment, which is a micro focus reflection source with a tungsten target, which has an output spectrum like this. 
And in terms of the ability to use continuous energy um, X-rays, you have many orders of magnitude, higher spectral brightness than such a source. Within the spectral lines, these are the X-ray emission lines of the target. You are talking about a few orders of magnitude, um, higher spectral brightness of the compact light source. Now, here is a comparison to kind of the state of the art or cutting edge um, sources. Um, the, the brightness of the CLS is higher than the um, kind of latest generation traditional sources. Uh, the spot size of the compact light source is a lot larger than the high brightness latest uh, sources which makes it much easier to handle and also produces a lot higher uh, total flux for many of the applications. Uh, X-ray energy it's continuously tunable um, and in the future that will cover the whole energy range from 4 to 100 kV that enables spectroscopy. And the Status is we have this in operation in Munich since 2015, and uh, they have published so far 20 publications, but the rate has been increasing, so uh, expect in the future quite a few more publications from that. The other point of comparison, of course, is how, how does this compare with a synchrotron? So our ambition is not to compare ourselves to undulator, fully coherent beamlines at the synchrotron, but to compare ourselves with what you can do uh, compared to synchrotron bending magnets. And depending on uh, which synchrotron you pick, uh, uh, kind of old, lay, uh, old generation synchrotron or the newer generation synchrotrons, and depending on which monochromator you use, what you can see is that in a focusing beam application with the Lincean compact light source, you will reach flux levels in focus that are comparable to synchrotrons. And in cases where you can use a multi-layer focusing system instead of the, the widely used silicon monochromators, even comparable, very comparable performance to synchrotrons. Um, so what, uh, what this shows is that in terms of applications, you can port applications that you do at the synchrotron bending magnet to the Lincean compact light source. And this is really the application space for that source. Now, did we have any questions so far? No, okay. So then we switch to the uh, last section of the presentation, uh, giving you an overview of how this can be used in the context of having an X-ray facility with multiple applications and disciplines uh, being pursued in one facility. So, as in the case of the synchrotron, the source itself is housed in an enclosure that has concrete walls to shield from the uh, radiation that is generated inside of the enclosure. And then you have um, experiments outside of the shielding wall that uh, you, you do your, your work on. This picture here shows you an example of how things look like at our facility a while ago. So you have here the shielding wall um, the shielding wall in this case also housed an X-ray optical system for focusing. And then we have developed uh, what we call the compact X-ray station or CXS, in which we have conducted um, a lot of the measurements that 
we are going to show you, especially about diffraction. And our, our um, proposal to customers is rather than building fixed touches like you would do at the synchrotron, uh, use the benefits of the compact light source in terms of not having higher harmonics, only having a, a very limited um, power in the X-ray beam, to have portable stations that can be easily exchanged. So then you can have many of these stations arranged along the beam to serve the different measurement needs. So in the first example, very close to the source, one example of an application is high resolution imaging. That means uh, optics-based imaging. This, is, this actually shows you an X-ray microscope that I myself helped develop at X-Radia that is meant to be for synchrotron applications. Um, it turns out that the properties of the compact light source, especially using a lower energy flavor of the compact light source, is very well matched to the requirements of matching such a system to the source. So you can uh, do field of view matching, 15 to 100 micrometers, and you get quite high flux in uh, the system that enables short measurement times. And we have also developed a concept to integrate a crystal monochromator uh, in the detector area to get the same type of energy resolution as at the synchrotron using a crystal monochromator to obtain spectroscopic information. So what this system can enable is to do full Zanes spectroscopy, 3D images at resolutions down to 30 nanometers, as is done at the synchrotrons. However, at the synchrotron, the state of the art is that you can have exposure times on the order of seconds. Uh, in this system, the exposure times that have been calculated will be slightly longer, so that will be on the order of tens of seconds or a few minutes per exposure. Another application close to the source is diffraction that also uses a focused beam um, in a one-to-one -one focusing geometry. And this was the application for which originally the funding was provided by the National Institute of Health to develop our source. So this shows you an example of a data set of a lysosine crystal, which is used as a benchmarking um, sample, 120 images, a total of 20 minute uh, acquisition time. And this data set has been done at an energy of 15.2 keV with a bandwidth of approximately 1%, which was narrowed down by the focusing optics. This data set has been reconstructed, and uh, the measurements show that we can obtain um, a resolution of the reconstruction that is actually very comparable to the resolution that can be obtained at a synchrotron beamline. So this table here shows you a comparison of uh, a synchrotron beamline at BESI. This was a measurement from BESI 2, where they measured the same type of sample. We re reach approximately the same resolution. That is in part uh, due to the ability to use high X-ray energy. Our, our focus size on the sample was even smaller than at the synchrotron. And uh, frame exposure was a little bit lower, but comparable. This was done with a very early version of the compact light source. If we do this on the new system that is being uh, developed right now, that will be um, 
we'll be able to do that uh, below a second per frame. We have also done some work on powder diffraction. Um, a pharmaceutical company approached us to examine what our sensitivity would be in terms of polymorphic drug contamination. So these, these are drugs that can exist in different crystalline states. And uh, so we collected um, powder diffraction data of a pure sample and several contaminated samples. And we could sh demonstrate to them that we can reach sensitivity levels that are uh, as good as uh, what you can obtain at the synchrotron and show them that, that the sensitivity is high enough to do this on a compact light source as well. Also very close to the source in a focusing geometry, one can do spectroscopic measurements. It turns out that the energy tunability of our source, uh, depending on uh, the kind of version that we are using, um, so there's two different versions, a low energy version in blue and, and the what we call standard version in green, you can cover a lot of the K and L edges on the periodic table to do spectroscopy. You are very familiar with the spectroscopic mapping uh, work that is being done at the Australian Synchrotron, shown here the ex example that is uh, very, has very high visibility of uh, reconstructing a painting that was painted over. And the, the reason we like to use this as an example is the, the key requirements why this had to be done at the synchrotron and not using a laboratory system is that you required very high flux because this are a lot of pixels, uh, about 32 megapixels. And it also required energy tunability to avoid uh, interferences with other emission lines. And this is something that can be done on a compact light source as well, this fluorescence mapping work. The main difference to the synchrotron is that the spot size on the sample at a synchrotron can be smaller for the equivalent uh, throughput. So that can be a factor of 10 or up to a factor of 100 smaller. Another thing that we have been working on together with a customer is the question of how can you uh, implement X-ray absorption spectroscopy on our source efficiently. And we have come up with a scheme of using the direct beam from the source with a polychromator to disperse the X-ray energies and using a pixelated detector to then detect all of the energy simultaneously on this detector. And uh, this is work in progress. No measurements have been conducted yet, but um, we, we are very confident that this will be a way to also get to very rapid uh, uh, acquisition of XR spectra using our source that can be competitive in throughput with um, just a plain vanilla synchrotron beamline. Um, as you move uh, further away from the source, um, another application that we have explored is scattering applications. That's also very well suited to the compact light source because it has a larger uh, tolerable energy spread. So you can use um, a multi-layer mirror to focus the X-rays. So we have performed preliminary measurements on samples from the National Institute of Standards and Technology where we put into the beam uh, semiconductor structures and used 
our existing optic detuned uh, to get a, a somewhat of a magnification through the sample onto a detector. And this shows you a raw data image of uh, such a sample that shows several diffraction orders from, from the sample uh, shown in the data here. And the question that uh, NIST was after is, how does the compact light source compare in terms of the ability to quickly measure these type of samples compared to the synchrotron versus laboratory sources? And to char characterize that, data was taken with different integration times and measuring the intensity in one of these diffraction peaks. And of course, this should be a straight line as is shown here. And what you can see here in red is the data for the compact light source, much higher than the system that they have at NIST, which is based on a molybdenum K-alpha uh, source. And we also penciled in here what you can expect with a liquid metal jet source. With the improvements uh, that we have made to the compact light source, we now um, can move this curve over to the solid red curve. And that shows you that we are kind of within an, uh, a factor less than 10 of what has been achieved at the APS at the time at their small angle scattering beam lines. So again, approaching synchrotron performance for small angle X-ray scattering. The customer in Munich, one of their main applications is uh, multimodal imaging. That means imaging at coarser resolution, but using additional contrast mechanisms. For those of you that are not familiar with this type of measurement, um, the way that that looks like is you, you have your, your sample, and then after the sample, you have a so-called beam splitter grading that requires a partially coherent beam. Hence, that's a good application for the compact light source. Then it produces an interference pattern at a characteristic distance that's called the Talbot distance, where in the absence of a sample, you just see the diffraction pattern. And then you can measure this interference pattern, and then you can measure the intensity distribution of these fringes by raster scanning and analyzer grading over it. And then on the detector in each pixel, as you raster the analyzer grading, you measure an intensity sinusoidal distribution here in blue without a sample. Now, what happens if you have an actual sample in it is the phase shift and scattering of the sample will influence the signal. And what you see is a phase shift of this undulation, which will give you the local phase shift. This is uh, measured as a gradient. Um, and then also a reduction in the, total, in the total modulation amplitude, which gives you a measure of the scattering signal. And of course, the overall attenuation in average intensity is the absorption signal. Now, this just illustrates what's, hap what's happening if you have these different signals on the top. This is just an insect cycling through the different contrast mechanisms from absorption to differential phase uh, uh, to scattering and then to di differential phase contrast. And you can see that the visibility of interior structures with low density differences and structures that have uh, very high spatial frequency features like the wings gets, get visible once you have these additional contrast modes. They employ this mainly for biomedical research. This is an early example of 
measurements that have been done at our factory in collaboration with the customer in Munich, where they have shown that you can devise combining absorption and scattering signal a way to diagnose diseased lungs where the fine structure of the lung is collapsing. That's called a disease called um, emphysema. So this shows you the difference in signals from a diseased lung where you have a big loss in scattering signal versus the control sample that has no uh, visible degradation in the uh, scattering signal and hence if these are healthy lungs. Again, these, these measurements not performed on humans. These are, in this case, were uh, excised lung samples from mice. They also do uh, investigation of human applications for, in this case, for breast cancer. That is a more recent publication of data that has been collected in, in Munich. And this not only is a multimodal image, it is also a quasi 3D reconstruction using not a full 3D data set, but a partially, a partial angle data set reconstructed by a method called tomosynthesis that shows that if you compare absorption with differential phase contrast imaging, with the scattering contrast imaging, you can generate contrast and see detail in the cancer tissue that is not really visible in, in the absorption image. So there is potential in using this technology for, to increase um, the diagnostic uh, capabilities of medical imaging devices. Um, and then, of course, rather than doing multimodal imaging, you can also just do larger sample imaging. Why would you want to do that with the compact light source? Is because you have a monochromatic beam, so you don't have issues with uh, beam hardening. You get quantitative data. You can tune your energy. And Munich now has started to work on using absorption edges to do functional imaging, to actually have samples that have absorption agents like iodine uh, to label specific function. Um, in the future, there will be a capability to go up to 100 kV of X-ray energy. And you have the advantage that you have a high flux, so it's a quasi-synchrotron experience. And also the beam is quasi-parallel, very collimated, which uh, if you want to do higher resolution imaging, makes it compatible with using optical magnification scintillator detection systems. So in conclusion, um, we use here X-ray microscopy as an example. The, the resources are limited at the synchrotron. You need higher performing laboratory systems. Um, there are some developments on traditional sources uh, that can enable somewhat higher throughput and even a limited amount of elemental imaging. But to get the full capability, um, to enable applications, full spectroscopy, doing in situ dynamic studies in 3D, which requires a lot of throughput, and to go to the highest resolution that's only achievable at the synchrotron, the pathway of choosing a Lincium compact light source is a very attractive one. Um, and in conclusion, we believe that the future of laboratory X-ray microscopy and X-ray applications in general is very bright. So just the material I showed on the other traditional source developments, they come from Wen Bing Yun and Hans Hertz. Uh, so want to acknowledge that. And of course, want to acknowledge our whole team uh, here that, that made this development possible. 
So thank you very much for your attention and we can now switch to answering some questions. So uh, Chuck Kasahara, who's here with me, he can probably read out what the questions are and then I can address them. Yes, so one, one of the questions is uh, whether in the near future it will be possible to achieve a submicron range spot size or is that something that's only going to be achievable at the synchrotron? Uh, so, of course you can achieve a micron or submicron spot size. However, in, uh, that comes at the expense of flux. And like, let's take for example the X-ray fluorescence mapping application. So we can have a very competitive throughput with spot sizes ranging from 100 micrometer, which would be a one-to-one -one, uh, focusing of the source to the sample. And then we can demagnify the spot by up to a factor of about three without compromising the flux. However, if you shrink the spot size further, then you start losing X-ray flux because you, you are limited in that case by the available brightness of the source. And, and uh, at one point it will become uh, less favorable compared to the synchrotron. So that the way I look at it from a practical standpoint is to get uh, comparable performance in terms of throughput, um, it's not desirable to, to go to uh, the smallest spot sizes or resolutions that you can go uh, at the synchrotron. So if you look, for example, at, at many of the applications that are being performed in Melbourne for the X-ray fluorescence mapping, a large fraction of those are actually performed at resolutions that are very coarse. And those are very well suited to the compact light source. But I would say if you look sub-micron or approaching using X-ray optics to go down to 100 nanometer of spot size or so, then you still are better off going to the synchrotron. So there's another question about uh, applications. Um, so the question is whether it's possible to do imaging under special conditions, such as under humidity or under different temperatures. So my, my answer to that uh, would be there's no there is no difference in, in doing measurements with ambient control to the synchrotron. You need to have the right hardware, of course, to control the environments. So far here at Lincian, we have not um, developed ourselves these ambient uh, environmental control systems to include that. Also in Munich, they have not really uh, utilized that uh, so far. And our philosophy is typically to look for um, uh, other companies or researchers to, to um, provide these solutions to be integrated for our customers. So just taking, taking um, one example, let's say for small angle scattering, we are actually recommending to customers to look at a solution uh, that is sold by another company, um, which is Saks Lab, uh, that has worked with us to come up with a system that can easily be coupled to our source and that will perform right out of the box with the same user experience and reliability as a, one of their regular laboratory systems. Of course, with a much higher performance, the energy tunability and so forth. 
So there's a, a couple of um, operations questions about the source. So one is, do you continuously inject or top off the uh, synchrotron? Um, is there a significant loss in, in uh, for every fo X-ray photon that's being created? Okay, so so that's very easy to answer. Um, the the effect of the X-ray generation is not really observable uh, in the synchrotron because we are re-injecting a new bunch into the synchrotron um, every 10 milliseconds or so. So there is no time for beam decay or X-ray generation to affect the electron beam properties. And really, the, the dominating effect in the source is not the interaction with the X-rays, but the dampening of the beam intensity, electron beam intensity by um, other effects. So another operational question is, how stable is the source? Is operator intervention uh, required? to keep the laser and e-beam optimally aligned? Okay, so that's also a very good question. And initially, when we delivered the source, uh, we delivered the source without a beam feedback system. And even without a beam feedback system, if the ambient controls inside of the enclosure of the source are to specifications, the source is very stable. So the initial acceptance criteria were actually stable operation for a period of three hours without operator uh, intervention, which we have easily achieved. Um, now, more recently, within the last half, uh, last year, we have collaborated with Munich to actually have an in situ beam monitor that monitors continuously the intensity, the position of the beam, so that we can actively uh, feed back the system in an automated fashion without any user uh, intervention. And uh, just to say, we don't have anybody of our company stationed over there. The, the source is run by um, graduate students and uh, staff at Munich. There, there is a training that's necessary to operate the source, so uh, it's, it's not like a TV that you operate immediately, but it's uh, after a few days of training, people are able to start up the source, get it, uh, get it into operational mode and then perform the experiments. The expertise required, I would compare with what you would find at a synchrotron in terms of a beamline scientist or beamline technician that needs to align a beamline. This type of skill set is sufficient to, to uh, operate the source. And one of the reasons that this B monitor has been worked on is that there's a desire in Munich to run the source unattended overnight, which is uh, being done more and more frequently now. So there's one, one final question is, uh, if we know whether microbeam collimation of the beam for biological sample and radiation has been performed with the compact light source? So in Munich, uh, they have a, a program to do microbeam radiation of, um, they, they started out with cell cultures and now have switched to irradiating um, uh, mice with a structured uh, X-ray beam, so that has been uh, already done, and uh, it's it's an interesting area for us in the future to see where that field goes. Because if you think about uh, practical treatment options using a structured beam like that, synchrotrons are not really very practical, and we would be positioned to. 
um, actually develop systems that could be used for, for treatment if this microbeam radiation was taking off in the future. There's one more question came in. Uh, how many permanent staff would you recommend for maintenance and operation? So um, our source, the way we handle this, uh, the customer is not responsible or takes care of the maintenance of the source. Uh, that is something that we, we have a contract and we perform. We go there every three months for a preventative maintenance visit. And we also do remote support or on-demand visits if there's an issue with the source to get it back in full uh, specification working order. So a uh, customer doesn't really uh, take care of the maintenance. In terms of the operation, I would say the goal always should be to have a 24-7 operation for a source like that, the same as the synchrotron. And uh, so that, that determines that you have to have somebody available that is trained to actually uh, facilitate the experiments. In Munich, in most cases, the people that do the measurements and perform the experiments also do the setup and, and kind of if there's any intervention needed on the source. So I would say very similar in terms of staffing need to a beam line at a synchrotron. Okay, so there is no more questions. So I would ask um, AXT to perhaps take back over and conclude the webinar. Oh, I'm, I've just unmuted myself. Um, uh, yeah, look, it, it, feel free. What I would suggest is if there are any other questions, I'm sure people have seen a couple other, other questions come in. I'm, I'm happy to answer them uh, offline via email. Uh, uh, you know, send it to uh, you, you, you know, um, send it to AXT is fine. Um, also, just as a, a word of a reminder that uh, that Michael, you um, you discussed the uh, fast source by Sigray. That we're actually having a Sigray presentation in a couple of weeks. It's another webinar, so. If people want to uh, be invited to that one, please remember that, that that one is occurring in a couple of weeks. I think that's to discuss their um, the Atom map and the source itself, but I think their Atom map and their Quantum Leap uh, system, which is their um, uh, XS system. But um, so in terms of the you know um, following on from this webinar, we're happy to have discussions with everybody to answer uh, uh, any further questions in regards to upkeep and all the rest of it. And then also in terms of, uh, I guess, gathering interest and gathering a kind of interested community in, in New South Wales to, um, you know, to look at the, the potential for getting a system into the country. So